Okay, everybody, my machine says that I'm recording now. So hopefully you uh, enjoyed the midterm and are ready for some more interesting, intimate lives of the world's famous artists, okay? So this lesson is scheduled for May the 8th, okay? So let me go through my usual routine here, sharing the screen, uh, going to the material, and slideshow. From the beginning, hopefully. There we go. All right, bring up the title. So again, school code is HUM Humanities 105, the intimate lives of the world's famous artists. Today we're getting a double punch, not separated between two people, but these are together because they were a couple. Six, if you see that. So we're gonna start with Frida Kahlo and the next person, Diego Rivera, I talk about was her honey. So let me get into this and this should be very enjoyable. Okay. So you see here, Frida, this is a picture of her, a real picture in 1932. Okay. So this stuff is not important. You know, her real name, her parents' name were called their own. Just she's known as Frida Kahlo. Some people call her to the stage as Frida and they know what they're talking about. Same when we get to her honey, which we'll see shortly. So here's a little background that I give you in case you're not familiar with any of her artwork or what country she was from. Right, so Magdalena, Carmen, Frida, Kahlo, y Calderon, Spanish pronunciation, okay, not important. Uh, Born July 6th, 1907. She died July 13, 1954. She was a Mexican painter known for her many portraits and then self portraits, a lot of her. And uh, works inspired by the nature and artifacts of Mexico, those things were central to her being. Inspired by the country's popular culture, she employed a naive folk art style. If you don't know what naive means, it means a kind of very, very innocent personality. So, You can use naive for a lot of city people call uh, country people naive because they've never lived in a big city. And, you know, you can tell them anything like, you know, that at midnight tigers come out in downtown L.A. And, oh, I didn't know that. But she had a na naive innocence folk art style to explore questions of identity. Post-colonialism gender, class, and race in Mexican society. So um, identity uh, and the kind of a tricky issue in Mexico because the uh, vast majority of the people are mixed with uh, from the different original tribes, Indian tribes in Mexico with Spanish. So people can come out in your family, different colors and people start trying to, try to understand which side they identify with. And then post-colonialism, which means what about Mexico after the Spanish were kicked out? You know, what does Mexico do on its own that gives it its unique uh, Mexican identity. And then gender, so we know about that. We're going through that now. Class, so again, rich and poor, educated, uneducated, different classes in the country. And then again, back to 
the distinction of race in Mexican society, you know, which is held, which group is held higher than the other or the same. So she explored those things through her paintings. Her paintings often had strong autobiographical elements, mixed realism with fantasy. So what that means is uh, a lot of the portraits had to do with her own life a different situation. And instead of just, let's say she makes a painting and Frida's drinking a coffee this morning, right? She mixes realism of her with fantasy things, right? So it could be like if you made a, uh, you painted a portrait of yourself, but you were flying and you had a cape like uh, Superman. So that's you with the realism, but yet there's fantasy. In addition to uh, belonging to the post-revolutionary, so that means post means after the Mexican Revolution, the movement was called Mexicayoto. Uh, the last part is an Aztec derivation, which sought to define a Mexican identity right away from the Spanish influence. Kahlo has been described as a surrealist or magical realist. So let me go over those terms. Okay. Surrealism is something uh, that does that is not real. You know, it's cool, looks pretty cool, trippy, what have you, but it's not real. Like you paint camels driving cars, you know, or uh, dogs playing baseball, something like that. They're not real, right? They're surreal. And then magical realist again. We're going back to the example I gave where uh, like you're painting yourself and you're flying wearing a cape like Superman. The realism again is you, the magical is the event of uh, flying, right? So uh, when we get into Salvador Dali, he was the master of surrealism. He's the one with the famous uh, melting clocks in the desert and weird stick figures walking around. So we'll get more into the surrealism at that point. Okay, so Frida, she is also known for painting about her experience of chronic pain. You will find out where this pain came from later when we read about her bus accident. It was very, very severe, it's very tragic accident that she had. Born to a German father and a mestiza mother. So to explain that Spanish term mestiza means mixed. Okay. So uh, what that means is her mother was Spanish and father was, doesn't say exactly which uh, Mexican Indian tribe, it could be Aztec, Totonaca, Chichimeca, who knows? But uh, so uh, the mother was mixed. Kahlo spent most of her childhood and adult life at La Casa Azul, which means the Blue House, uh, her family home in Coyoacan. And just to guys let you know, I've been there. It's a museum now, it's pretty cool in Mexico City, I'd been there a long time ago. And now public here says, oh, look at this, that's the Frida Kahlo Museum. Yes, it is. I think when I went years ago, it was free. Now, obviously they're gonna have to charge, but you should go check it out. They have her original works there and other things about photos and different things about her relationship with Diego. If you know a lot of world history, even about Trotsky, you know who Trotsky was and what happened to him there. I won't spill the beans for you, but look it up, you'll be shocked. Uh, although she was disabled by polio as a child, 
Uh, polio was a disease that the United States overcame. I don't know why it, it, it came about. I don't know what the deficiencies were. Um, but uh, a lot of children had polio and they would wear these metal braces on their knees and crutches to walk around. I guess it affected their bones. By the time I came around, it was already, they had a medicine for it. The kids didn't get it anymore. So I'm just remembering now, um, if you saw the movie Forrest Gump, when they showed him as a kid, he had polio, those braces around his knees and legs. He had polio, but then it shows him running away from those bullies and they broke. So I guess that means they found, uh, at that time they found the medicine for it. I'm not sure, but yeah, that's polio. And she had it, it did it disable her. Uh, Carlo had been a promising student headed for medical school to being injured in a bus accident at the age of 18, which caused her lifelong pain and medical problems. If I remember correctly, what happened was it was hit by another car and the metal railing from outside of the bus came inside and a big piece of metal pushed through her, I guess I wanna say her stomach and out her back or the side. So that was really tough to try and save her life. I don't think medical technology was that good at that time, 1920 something. So anyway, it caused her lifelong pain and medical problems. It says during her recovery, she returned to her childhood interest in art with the idea of becoming an artist. And I guess that's a fantastic stroke of luck. I mean, obviously, the first thing is, I guess, she was disabled enough not to be able to become a doctor. But that career goal, the door was closed. And uh, if it wasn't for that, then the world would not have been able to enjoy her art. She would have not, not have pursued and blossomed into the world-famous artist that she became better for the world, right? Uh, Carlo's interest in politics and art led her to join the Mexican Communist Party in 1927, through which, through which she met fellow Mexican artist Diego Rivera. Uh, the couple married in 1929 spent the late 1920s and early 1930s traveling in Mexico, the United States together. During this time, she developed her artistic style, drawing her main inspiration from Mexican folk culture. So that's a traditional, there's actually various folk cultures in Mexico. So. Well, let's see, every country has this original uh, cultural dress, dance, things like that. And she painted mostly small self-portraits that mixed elements from pre-Columbian and then the Catholic beliefs, which again, when the Spanish came in, they brought uh, Catholicism. And so the pre-Columbian means whatever Mexican Indian tribe she identified with. Her paintings raised the interest of surrealist art artist André Breton, who arranged for Kahlo's first exhibition at the Julian Levy Gallery in New York in 1938. First ex uh, exhibition. While the French exhibition was less successful, the Louvre, which is the, uh, some say the world's most famous, museum, but uh, we'll, we'll just say in France, it's the most famous museum, uh, art museum, uh, purchased a painting from Kahlo, The Frame, making her the first Mexican artist to be featured in their French collection. Wow, I didn't know she was the first. 
throughout the 1940s. Kahlo participated in exhibitions in Mexico and the United States and worked as an art teacher. She taught at the Escuela Nacional de Pintura, which means the Escuela's School, so National School of Pintura Painting, uh, Escultura Sculpture, and Grabado, which could be filmmaking, La uh, Esmeralda, and was founding member of the Seminario de Cultura Mexicano or Mexicana, which is a seminary of Mexican culture, which protects and promotes traditional Mexican cultural uh, items and identity. Carlos always fragile health, fragile means very weak, susceptible to dying or more sickness, began to decline in the same decades. So our health started going down. She had her first solo exhibition in Mexico in 1953, shortly before her death in 1954 at the age of 47. So as you see, she lived a very short life, poor thing. Okay. Carlos work as an artist remained relatively unknown until the late 1970s when her work was rediscovered, rediscovered by art historians and political activists. By the early 1900s, not only had she become a recognized figure in art history, but she was also regarded as an icon for Chicanos, the feminism movement and the LGBTQ plus community. Um, Chicanos are Mexicans born in the United States and raised in the United States. So they really loved her art. The feminine, feminism movement, which you know is a movement to promote women, give them power. And then now recently we've been, uh, this list keeps on getting longer, the LGBTQ plus, I think there's a couple more letters now. Uh, Carlos' work has been celebrated internationally as emblematic of Mexican national. So emblematic means the standard of Mexican national and indigenous, which are original Indian people, Mexico traditions, and by feminists for what is seen as its uncompromising depiction of the female experience and form. So. Um, what they're saying there is, in, to my knowledge, uh, earlier art was not considered, or they did not consider like a woman painting about women's experiences in many different ways. That was something that they were not interested in. So when she came along, said, I'm going to paint these things of me doing all kinds of things and different kinds of pain and experiences that only women go through. Times had changed. And like I said, so these groups, like feminists, they see her with great pride because at the time that was not something that was popular. Okay, that's why things work rediscovered later, okay? So artistic or early career, Paolo enjoyed art from an early age, receiving drawing instructions from printmaker Fernando Fernandez. That's like Johnny Johnson, right? Who was her father's friend and filing notebooks with sketches. In 1925, she began to work outside of school to help her family. After briefly working as a stenographer, she became an engraving apprentice for Fernandez. He was impressed by her talent, although she did not consider 
art as a career at this time. But unfortunately, a severe bus accident at the age of 18 gave her lifelong pain. She was confined to bed for three months following the accident. So here's a little more detail that you'll need. Uh, and she began to paint. She started to consider a career as a medical illustrator, so dead bodies as well, which would combine her interests in science and art. Her mother provided her with a specialty made easel. Uh, a couple of stories ago, I talked about the easel. So think of the traditional, uh, you've seen it all over the world, a piece of wood that the artist puts their thumb through and holds it with their left hand, let's say. And then on top of this wooden easel, there's, you see different spots of paint, blue, black, white, whatever, and then they hold the brush on the right. So that's an easel, which enabled her to paint in bed. And her father lent her some of his oil paints. She had a mirror placed above the easel so that she could see herself. Painting became a way for Kahlo to explore questions of identity and existence. She explains, I paint myself because I am often alone and I am the subject I know best. Very interesting, right? So of her, she's fighting her loneliness by painting, painting herself because she's alone. She knows herself best. I bet she, my assumption is that she probably had a lot of inner conversation. Some people don't. You know, a guy can, I've known friends, the guy just stands there and stares at the wall for hours after hours, not really thinking of anything. Or, you know, a buddy that's just attached to the television watching sports. But in her loneliness, it propelled her to think and to create art. Very interesting talented lady. She later stated that the accident and the isolating, which means the alone time, recovery period made her desire to begin again, painting things just as she saw them with her own eyes and nothing more. Again, the vision staying true to her heart, not trying to paint on what was accepted at the time or what was popular. It's like, I'm gonna paint what I want and what I'm familiar with. Most of the paintings Carlo made during this time were portraits of herself, her sisters and her school friends. Her early paintings and correspondence show that she drew inspiration, especially from European artists, in particular Renaissance masters such as Sandro Botticelli and Bronzino in the avant-garde movements such as Due Sachlitschke and Cubism, which I'm not going to ask you any questions about those peoples or movements, so don't worry. It's just filler information. Uh, moving to Morelos uh, in Mexico in 1929 with her husband, Rivera, Paula was inspired by the city of Cuernavaca, where they live, she changed her artistic style and increasingly drew inspiration from Mexican folk art. Art historian Andrea Kettenmann states that she may have been influenced by Adolfo Best Maugart's treatise on the subject, for she incorporated many of the characteristics that, she, that he outlined. For example, the lack of perspective and the combining of elements from pre-Columbian and colonial periods of Mexican art. So instead of, let's say, she just paints Spanish things from the colonial period or just Indian motifs from the pre-Columbian, she combines and mixes them in the same Mexican art, which is a mix of what most people are. Her identification with la raza, which means the race or the people, the people of Mexico, and her profound interest in its culture remained important facets of her art throughout the rest of her life. 
Okay, so that's a great, great background for her. And I think she deserves it. What's a great lady. Now to her honey, a handsome guy there, right? You'll see, you'll hear what she feels about him. So Diego Rivera, possibly even more worldwide famous than her. You'll, you'll, you can make your own conclusion. Okay, Diego Maria de la Concepcion Juan Nepomuceno Estanislao de la Rivera y Parrientos Acosta y Rodriguez. Uh, if that isn't a name that screams to be shorter, I don't know what isn't. Uh, Mexican people uh, kind of combine the parents' name, uh, the one father's name with the mother's name, the last name, the first name, and it makes for some really long traditional names. But known as Diego Rivera, was born December 8, 1886, and died November 24, 1957. So you'll see not too long after uh, Frida passed away, he also passed away. Not like, oh, five years later, 10 years later. No, just a couple of years later. And was a prominent Mexican painter. Um, his large frame helped establish or fame. The mural movement in Mexico, so murals are like sometimes you see murals on the side of buildings where have these giant paintings on the side of a building or a parking lot, and that's what he painted. So she remember, she painted small, intimate paintings of her daily life, and he painted on a large scale, okay, large scale. So between 1922 and 1953, Rivera painted murals in, among other places, Mexico City, Chapingo, which is another city in Mexico, and Cuernavaca, Mexico, and in San Francisco. See the difference there? Actually, San Francisco was named by the Spanish, so it would have to be San Francisco, but English is San Francisco, uh, Detroit, and New York City. United States in 1931, a retrospective exhibition of his works was held at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So a retrospective means kind of like a, a showing of his past to present works. This was before he completed his 27 mural series known as Detroit Industry Murals. Rivera had four wives, so uh, I guess it doesn't matter if you looked at his picture and you said, well, I don't think that's the most handsome guy around, but uh, married four ladies, and, and we will learn about how much uh, Rita loved him. So, And he had many children. Uh, including at least one natural daughter. His first child and the only son died at the age of two. His third wife was Mexican fellow artist Frida, Frida Kahlo, with whom he had a volatile, which means they fought a lot, relationship that continued until her death. His fourth and final wife was his agent. So yes, uh, even though he lived only a couple of years after Frida died, he did marry a fourth and final time. Due to his importance in the country's art history, yeah, he was more important in Mexico at that time. The government of Mexico declared Rivera's works as monumentos históricos, so historic monuments, because again, remember, he painted on a large scale these giant murals. As of 2018, Rivera holds the record for the highest price at auction for a work by a Latin American artist. Uh, 1931 painting, The Rivals, part of the record setting collection of Peggy Rockefeller and David Rockefeller, sold for US 9.76. You don't hear these names anymore, but uh, when I was a boy, you just heard the last name Rockefeller. Right away, you thought of millionaires. 
because the Rockefeller family was, I think at one time, the richest family, at least in the United States. I don't know about the world, but at least in the U.S. So that's why you see numbers like 9.76 million for a painting, as I guess it. For people with that kind of money, being a multimillionaire, uh, if you're a multimillionaire, I guess you can spend 9.76 million on a painting and say, that didn't hurt me, right? Okay, so again, these are drawings of Diego, Frida. So you can see the little painting here of her dressed in traditional uh, Mexican folklore dress. This mask is supposed to be like a little love note from her to him. Uh, here he's drawing like the history of Mexico with uh, Aztec Indians here. This monkey represents one of the pets that she had. She loved pets. And then uh, this is funny, this tambourine. Um, she demanded that he play a tambourine and dance for her. So that's why you see it. And then the paintbrush they share because they were both uh, artists. Okay. So continue. So frog face and the walking flower, those are nicknames that they had, right? Obviously, uh, he was not the walking flower. That was her. She wore a lot of flowers if you just saw that uh, painting, her hair, and then well, some people called him frog face. Um, so Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, born 1886 in Guanajuato, Mexico, died in 1957 in Mexico City. That was Rivera. Born in 1907 and died in in 1954 in Boyacan, Mexico, which is an area of Mexico City. And that was Frida. So distinguished Mexican muralist, Diego, giant murals, and distinctive Mexican painter, kind of on a smaller, more intimate scale, stormily married to each other. So again, referring to the fact that they fought quite a lot and would break up, but somehow always come back together. So starting when Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo were married, he was 42, and on his third marriage, she was 22, so he was 20 years older, and the marriage was her first. He was a national monument. Now look at that, they're calling him, not his artwork, but he was considered by the Mexican government as a national monument because they just, Loved how his murals showcased the mixed and uh, interesting uh, Mexican culture and what made it what it was. And she was teaching herself to paint at the time of her uh, and There were plenty of other differences between them. So many differences. So it's like, Again, when I was growing up, we used to hear this term when we see people who are very different from each other, not only in age, right? And people used to say, well, opposites attract. He weighed 300 pounds and was more than six feet tall. So large that he couldn't find underwear to fit. She had it made for him in bright pink cotton. <laughs> I think that was her joke for him. Like, I'll make it for you or have it made, but I want you to wear pink. She was 98 pounds, so over three. So he was not twice her size, three times her size. Five feet, three inches. So short. People called him or called them the elephant and the dove. That's the people's nicknames or what they call them, elephant and the dove. Rivera was someone to lean on with the energy of 10 men, capable of working for days at a time. Galo was fragile, which means very weak. Childhood polio had caused one of her legs to stop growing. See, so that's her disablement, polio. 
And at age 18, she suffered severe injuries when she was pierced. Like I said, the metal railing went through her body by an iron, iron handrail in a horrific bus accident. She went on to endure 32, 32 operations in attempts to relieve the pain. She couldn't paint for more than an hour at a time and was often bedridden, which means she was so physically exhausted that she had to lie down by the lot. Vera's art covered entire buildings and dealt encyclopedically with the land and the people of Mexico. So when they say encyclopedically, um, I don't, you know, when I was a kid, there was no computers and no internet. That's even when I was in high school. Oh my God, how old am I? So people always bought these books. They always started from letter A to Z and they were encyclopedias and they had all the information listed in them. So when they say that he painted encyclopedically, he normally painted going back to the first Indians that had occupied Mexico through the Spanish period and then post-colonialism. So trying to touch on uh, every stage he could of Mexican history. So that's why the encyclopedically. Uh, Carlos' paintings were small, some the size of this book, which is not a big book, amusing, and most were deeply personal. It's not necessarily, you didn't see him in his paintings where you saw her in her paintings that were so personal. Rivera was a messy dresser. It means how he wore his clothes. He wore baggy overalls. The kind of overalls that farmers wear. Usually paint smeared, which means he had a lot of old paint stains on his clothes. Big black shoes. A Stetson hat. And he often carried a large pistol. Kind of reminds me of someone we read about earlier who came out of the house when there was a crowd and shot the pistol in the air. But I don't think Diego did that. Carlo took such exquisite care with her clothes, no matter how she was feeling, that people called her the walking flower. She wore elaborate blouses, which means many kinds of decorations long skirts of purple or red velvet, and layers of petticoats she embroidered with Mexican sayings. She pulled back her hair tightly, embellishing it with clips, combs, and fresh blossoms. So embellishing means when she pulled her hair back, she put these things like flowers and clips and clones and who knows, seashells, anything to make her look more like a flower or something beautiful. It's like a Korean ladies putting a pignon in the back of their hair or hanging little shiny things in the layers of their hair, same kind of thing. She pulled her hair back tightly Oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes she wore so much jewelry, she was known to hear 20 rings at once. <laughs> so she was known to wear 20 rings. So I guess that's two for each finger, right? Two times five is 10. So you got five fingers on the right hand. That's 10 rings. Two times five, so 20 rings. And since she wore 20 rings, sometimes she clanked when she moved. Clank is the sound of metal that hits together. Right, so if you had two pots, it would go clank, clank, clank. So I guess her fingers were clanking, right? Uh, he ate a lot. Remember, he was over 300 pounds. Kahlo would bring him big lunches and baskets covered with flowers and love notes. Well, she was a picky eater. So if you're picky, you don't like a lot of things or the things that you like. 
you like them a certain way. She could think of only three American foods she liked. Malted milk, applesauce, and American cheese. Okay. So, malted milk. So she probably liked uh, shakes, only chocolate shakes. Rivera could be generous, but frequently was unreliable. Can't rely on the fellow. Too absorbed in his work to take much interest in people or money. So, so involved with himself. Uh, that's it probably that's why he didn't have a lot of friends, right? He didn't have time to give them. Sometimes he left large checks lying around for years before he cashed them. Carlo was thoughtful and could listen to people for hours, always wanting to hear someone's life story. She kept scrupulous accounts of her money. So that means even if someone wrote him a big check, I didn't bother to deal with it. Very unreliable. You leave checks around for a long time now, not even forget years, just months, the bank probably won't cash it for you. And didn't have time for friends or to listen to other people. He was absorbed in himself. So Kahlo was the complete opposite. She was thoughtful. And if you had a problem, you could talk to her. She would listen to you for the longest time. She'd want to hear your story. And as far as her money, I guess she spent her checks right away and kept scrupulous, which is like an accounting's version. Like, I got this check on this day. I cashed it at this time. I know how much money is left over. So... Very different personalities when dealing with money issues. Okay. At 15, Paolo had told friends that her ambition was to have children with the famous Diego Rivera. By the time they married, he didn't want more than several children he already had. And after numerous miscarriages, miscarriages are where Paolo did get pregnant, but during the pregnancy, somehow lost the babies. So Paolo sadly accepted that she was too frail or weak-bodied to have children. Too bad that's what she really, really wanted. For all their differences, what kept Paolo and Rivera together? I'm sure all of us have seen couples that as they say, fight like cats and dogs. And then later you say, well, they, they're going to get divorced. Or they're going to break up, you know. And somehow they get back together or they stay together and say, what is the deal here? So both love to laugh. So that's something that joined together. She had a contagious belly laugh, which means she had a strong laugh that came straight from her stomach. And once wrote, nothing is worth more than laughter. So to her, laughter was just the number one thing that made her happy through all her pain. She tried whenever possible to deal with her pain by using humor. That is a well-known technique. Many comedians gag people, as they say. You're like, why are they so funny? You know, and nine times out of 10, you find out they had a bad childhood or a bad life. And that was their way of surviving was through humor. Um, Rivera was known as a hugely entertaining teller of tall tales or stories. And he made up stories about himself. So I, I don't know exactly if he said, you know, I'm so rich or had 50 girlfriends or I don't you know I don't know they don't have a 300 IQ uh, at parties the two of them made friends by pouring powdered sugar all over a table and creating city cityscapes so I guess they must be talented because I can pour powdered sugar all over a table and I cannot let's say recreate the LA skyline so they obviously were artists and could create these cityscapes just from powdered sugar. Both were concerned about improving their country's government. 
Rivera believed that art could transform society, which means completely change it, and that murals were the best way for ordinary people to see art. Kahlo joined him in marches and other efforts for social change. So they wanted social change in Mexico to help the poor and uneducated. They both had strong opinions and had so many fights, separations, and reconciliation. So reconciliation is where they make up and get back together. Each also had many affairs. So even though they were married, I guess they both dated other people, but they always came back to one another each was the central figure in the other's life. When Kahlo was in the hospital, Rivera would rock her to sleep or entertain her by pretending to be a circus bear dancing around her bed with a tambourine. Very cute. She signed her, let signed her letters to him with magenta pink lipstick kisses and did everything she could to make him happy. So you see, typical fighting with cats and dogs, but yet in their relationship, when they're together, just the most loving of people or a couple. Unbelievable. Both drew crowds. That means when they went out, many people once you know saw them, they just kept the oh, there's Frida, there's Diego. Crowds just uh, came forth. Rivera at work was considered a must see. Uh, Tourist attraction. So when he's painting a giant mural, many people came. Okay. People would buy tickets just to watch it paint. I didn't know they bought tickets. I thought they just showed up. But I'm just gonna close this door here. It's a little too noisy, so I'm gonna close the door. Yep. Hopefully no more yelling will be heard in the background. Okay, so again, where I left off was that people would actually pay money to, I guess, stand behind a rope and watch him paint the whole building side. Galo and her outfits could stop traffic because they were so shiny, so colorful, so beautiful. Parades of children would follow her. Together, they were a sensation. He presented himself like a king, so you see he had some ego there. She carried herself like a queen, because a king needs a queen, right? When they entered a theater, people looked at them instead of at the performers on the stage. So imagine that. You're in a theater watching a play. This actor is great. The other actor is great. But Diego and Frida come into the building, and then People started watching them instead of the, the, the play that was being performed. Details of their colorful, glamorous life were written up in the papers, a lot of gossip. And people the world over addressed them by their first names. They didn't say Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, they're just Diego, Frida. So kind of like, a, you know, now you have Cher, Beyonce, Right, used to have Whitney. So if you're that famous, that's how people address you. Both were childlike and easily bored with anything except themselves and each other. He preferred her to bathe him, so he preferred that she give him a bath. Otherwise, he wouldn't bathe. So I guess even if she didn't feel like doing it after a few days and maybe started smelling a little strong, then she would perform the bath to 
make the smell go away. I don't know. And he demanded lots of bath toys like a little boy. I think I outgrew bath toys at like five years old. She had an enormous collection of dolls. Whenever friends left on a trip, she would request, bring me a doll. And pets. Remember I mentioned pets earlier? Including spider monkeys. That was the pet painted in the picture of the book. Turkeys. That's Turkeys can get quite large. and can fly. I don't know why. She... Turkeys. And then uh, parrots. Right? Parrots are the birds that can mimic what you say. Hello. How are you? Good morning. Right? Uh, whatever language it, you know, Buenos dias, como estas? Or, mañana uh, seo. One parrot named Bonito, which means beautiful or handsome, slept under the covers with her. So um, I've known some cats and dogs that won't get under the blankets with you, but a parrot got under the blankets with her? Wow. Um, they liked each other's looks. So again, even if someone said, you know, hey, this guy looks like a frog or... Rita's not the most traditionally beautiful woman in the world. They loved each other's looks. Ultimately, that's the most important thing in a relationship. Who cares what anybody else says or the world? You have to love each other's looks. Uh, Rivera admired her Carlos eyebrows, which were quite large, strong. Uh, they met in the middle. So she, a lot of women, if their eyebrows connect in the middle, they shave the center, which she never bothered to do. And she had a light mustache, light hair-wise, but she had black hair, so you could see it. And most women, if they have some kind of mustache, they have the hairs plucked, but not her. And he liked it. He was furious once when she shaved it off, so look at that. So I guess she thought, well, I'm going to look more beautiful, and I'm not a man, so I'll have this mustache shaved off. And then he didn't like it. It was the opposite. During their especially bitter quarrels, the quarrels is a British word for fights, she would wound him by cutting off her long hair. So that's a traditional thing, too. Obviously, he loved her long hair, so she would cut it short, and he didn't like it. It made him very angry or sad. And then she teasingly called him frog face, even though she did love him and fat belly. See, but in truth, she adored his Buddha-like appearance, right? So she liked it. She liked his stomach, even though she said, hey, fat so, but privately, she's like, it's okay, I like it. Above all, they respected each other's art. Carlo thought Rivera was the greatest artist in the world and defended him verbally and even physically. She once jumped between him and a man with a gun. That's how much she loved him and wanted to protect him. When Picasso asserted that no one could paint like Kahlo, Rivera agreed. We are all clods, which means no talents, next to Frida, Rivera said. And he did all he could to encourage her. And that's a lot because I don't think... Frida had the talent to do what he did with these giant murals that encyclopedically painted Aztec Indians to Spaniards to priests to whatever was included in the Mexican history. I don't think she could have done it, especially on that scale. But he still said, no, she's more talented than I am, right? And he did all he could to encourage her. Both were successful. Critics lionized him, which means that it has nothing to do with a real lion, but means that they just could not stop plotting him or giving him credit or saying, you know, he's the best. And she had no trouble selling every work she painted. So uh, who knows, maybe some of his paintings he didn't sell, but everything she painted on a much smaller scale sold. That's how popular she was. I know a lot of his works could not be sold because they belong to the Mexican government. If you paint the side of a building or a museum, nobody can buy that. 
They lived in Mexico City in two separate houses linked by a bridge. Her house was blue, his house was pink. For the time, it should have been opposite, but who know? Concerned over neighbors' approval of their guests, so maybe they had very noisy, wild guests and the neighbors didn't like it. They simply bought the lot next door to put more distance between them and their neighbors. So they bought some adjoining buildings and so the neighbors were pushed or they lived farther out. So they got the closed spaces around them so they could be, I guess, as noisy as they wanted to be. They had their parties. After a long breakfast together, he would disappear to work and she would go to her studio or to Tarzan movies, which were very popular at the time in black and white, or the Three Stooges or the Marx Brothers, or to boxing matches. At night, they met for late suppers of hot chocolate and sweet rolls. Less than a year before, she died at 47. Galo made herself part of an exhibit of her work too ill to leave her huge four-poster bed. She had the bed moved to the gallery. So she stayed in the bed. People moved it to the gallery, but she could not get out of bed. She was too weak, too sick. And this is where Fred sang songs to her. The last words she wrote in her diary were, I hope the exit is joyful, meaning her death. And I hope never to come back. So a lot of people will tell you, hey, die, I want to come back. I want to be live again. She was quite different. She was like, I don't want to come back to living. After her death, friends reported that Rivera became an old man in a few hours. So right after she died, he aged very quickly. I guess he missed her so deeply. He soon remarried, but died at age 71, within three years of his marriage after a stroke. So less than three years later, he had died probably of a broken heart. So artworks, Rivera painted more than two and a half miles of murals in his lifetime. So. When you paint large murals on buildings, that's how they measure them in miles. The first was a series of 124 panels encompassing or covering the entire history of Mexico. It took him more than four years to do that, working eight to 15 hours at a stretch to do all the painting by hand. Upon completing the work, he was instantly famous. Rivera's murals, which always sparked controversy, were vulnerable to attack by mutilation or acid throwing. So some people would attack the paintings. They didn't like them. The most rigorous protest came when Rivera, a foreigner, worked inside New York City's Radio City Music Hall. His murals were destroyed before he could finish. Somebody in New York didn't like this um, Mexican artist's <laughs> artwork. The two Fridas, probably Carlos' most famous work, was painted during a painful separation from Rivera. They divorced and remarried the next year. So even divorce did not keep them apart, you know, ultimately. Most of her work was autobiographical. When she was bedridden, it was convenient with mirror in hand to paint herself. Those who didn't find her work shockingly personal valued it highly. Diego and I became the first Latin American painting to sell more than $1 million. Rockstar Madonna owns Self-Portrait with Monkey and other color works. Yes, Madonna was a big fan of Frida Kahlo. And Frida and Diego Rivera, the painting Kahlo did for their wedding, he holds his palette and brushes more tightly and he holds her hand. Her way of showing that with him, art came first. 
She holds no art supplies to show that she valued him even more than her art. Symbolism you have to look for in the art piece itself. Question time. Yay. That means no more uh, reading. Okay. We've got that with the reading. So here we go. One, which nicknames did people call Frida and Diego? So don't be confused and use the nicknames they called each other. What nicknames did people call them? How many operations did Frida have to fix her injuries? To fix her bus? Uh, oh, I did it twice. Sorry. To fix her bus accident injuries. Fix it. How many? Give me the number only. How did Diego dress himself? Did he buy himself expensive suits? Did he wear shorts and a tie? How did he dress himself? Or describe how Frida and Diego's personalities were different. They were quite different. Please describe each one. Five, what did they do at parties to make people laugh? Did they tell jokes? Did they sing songs? What did they do to make people laugh? Six, when they entered a theater together, how did people treat them? Where's your ticket, Bob? What did they do? How did they act? Seven, list some pets that Frida owned. Was Chihuahua, Snake, Crocodile? What did she own? Eight, above all, what did they respect about each other? Above all, major. Nine, why did they buy the lot between each other? So why did they buy the property between themselves. And after Frida died, what happened to Diego? Okay. All right, so we're done with this lesson. Okay, very good. Hit the stop share. All right, so until next week, which will be week seven, take care of yourselves. Hopefully you enjoyed this lesson of this couple. And we'll talk to you soon.